I was out playing on all the special teams, and I guess my legs had just kind of gotten tired and realized I was running down on the kickoff. We had just scored. And all of a sudden, my legs, I just feel like it popped. Trainers come out, and, and I'm down. I'm like, man, I'm trying to think, did I blow out my knee? Is, you know, what's going on? And I look up, John's, you know, he's coming across the field like this. <laughs> you know, he's just, you know, like, with, with intent. Like, he's coming, I'm going, oh. Because, so you know, you're embarrassed. You know, like, not the owner's coming out of the <laughs> I go back to Chuck. John's on one knee doing the Our Father. He's praying with Carl, who was a religious man at the time, about their injury. And I just looked at the moment. No owner is doing this. This was passion. I think family always comes first, and then, you know, Argonauts probably, and then his acting. I don't remember him doing too many movies or anything during that time period. But um, definitely, I think they came second, if not first. He really did live and die double blue. I might have been one of the last persons to talk to John before he passed away. He called to tell me that the team was going to be sold and they would no longer be involved. They decided to pull out his partners. Did you get the sense that he was sad? Oh, absolutely. He went along with the decision, but uh, yeah, he was sad. I get on the plane that morning, I fly up to Vancouver, and it comes over on the radio that uh, John Candy just passed away that morning uh, down in Mexico doing his film. And I had to stop the car and pull over to the side of the road. I just couldn't believe it. Who wants an orange whip? Orange whip? Orange whip? Three orange whips. John Candy was a, a bona fide movie star comic movie star. Where do you live? In the city. Do you have a house? Apartment. On a rent? Rent. What do you do for a living? Lots of things. Where's your office? I don't have one. He is an icon. John, is work still fun for you? The work is, and I tell you, the business part of it wears thin for me now. Mm -hmm. uh, that really does. I, I, the negotiations on all the people and everybody's your friend and it's your new best friend. That's it for the Redskins. I'm going through that point in my life, I think, right now, I'm sort of cutting back and reflecting a little bit back. What do I want to do now? I was uh, on the board of directors of Hollywood Park Racetrack. On the board was Harry Ernest. And uh, we were talking one day, and he just said, uh, you know, you, you like Canadian sports. He said, I just uh, bought into the Toronto Argonauts and the CFL. I said, oh, that's interesting. John loved it more than anybody, and I think one of the reasons that Bruce McNall actually pursued the Toronto Argonauts is because John Candy uh, so much wanted to be a part of it. In February 1991, Bruce McNall, Wayne Gretzky, and John Candy purchased the Toronto Argonauts. We bought the team for $5 million, and John and uh, Wayne each took 10%. I realized one thing at the time, though, with John, and that is that, you know, this could get expensive. So I said, you know, maybe we should cap John. So we did. We capped him at a million dollars, I think it was, so that he couldn't lose more than that, no matter what happens. Going into ownership with Bruce McNall and Wayne Gretzky was a perfect fit for John Candy. McNall was a successful and high-profile sports owner who, in dramatic star-studded fashion, had turned the Los Angeles Kings around and made hockey a hot attraction in Southern California. McNall saw similar turnaround potential in both the Argonauts and the CFL. But for John Candy, purchasing the Toronto Argonauts was about much more than business. It was personal. When we first uh, started Second City, we used to call uh, John Johnny Toronto. You know that that you know th this kind of this kind of dude, right? Because he just kind of had his finger on everything, and that character kind of morphed into Johnny Larue. Well, 
I'm Johnny LaRue. John buying the argument was, was that he, we told him, John, you've, you're actually now turning into Johnny LaRue. You now own a football team. It was just kind of like this, like, uh, Argonaut tidal wave kind of hit our family. You just see there was excitement all around about it. It got to the point where um, on my mom's birthday we had a Rose Bowl, so we would actually create our own football teams. We'd get everyone, we'd get jerseys made, and, you know, we had teams and we'd play together. How great is it he becomes an owner of his hometown team? Just think about it, how great is that? So he was very, he's loved it. John Candy was born in Newmarket, Ontario, but grew up in East York, a Toronto suburb. His father passing away when John was five, Candy didn't gravitate to football until high school. Played left tackle uh, on the offensive line. He was a funny guy, but when it came to football, he was very serious about being good at what he did. Oh, my goodness. Wow. From 1967, junior champs at Neil McNeil. That was his forte. That was his outlet. Toronto on the Hamilton 26-yard line. Cookie Gilchrist, Dick Shadow, they were our football heroes for sure. John definitely had season's tickets. That was a quasi-religion for him, you know, going to Argo games. He wanted a career in football. When he was in high school, he's like, okay, I'm going to be a football player. He had a like, pretty serious knee injury that prevented him from playing further. And I think that he was uh, saddened by that, because I, I know he loved football very much. I had started a talent agency, and we had opened an office right across from Eaton's College Street. And they had a cafeteria in the basement. And a couple of times I had bumped into this young man and we just got along great i asked him what he wanted to do did he want to be an actor and he sort of said no he wanted to be a football player but he'd been injured and it just so happened that that day um, we got delivered to us a commercial and they were looking for young men to play in a football team to his surprise he got it. And I told him, here, you're playing a football player now. You, you can say you were a football player. And he said, yes, but one day I'm going to own the Argos. And I thought it, it was a joke. And he was serious. He said, no, I'm going to own the Argos. It's become the National Football League's right of spring. And hello once again, everybody. I'm Chris Berman. Last night, Rocket Ishmael decided to lift off and land as a member of the Toronto Argonauts of the Canadian Football League. In 1991, Rahib the Rocket Ismail out of the University of Notre Dame was the projected number one overall pick at the NFL Draft. Forgoing the NFL, Ismail signed a record four-year, $18 million contract with Bruce McNall and the Toronto Argonauts. I think it was more of a shock than anything else. He's not going to the Dallas Cowboys. He's going to go play in the CFL. Candy was thrilled. Overnight, there was a buzz in Toronto. How many tickets are you looking for? Phones have been ringing off the hook. Everyone was talking about the Argonauts. We do welcome John Candy and Maureen O'Hara. Has, uh, has John tried to sell you an interest in any, in any football teams at all? Not you. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> the Argonauts, yes. You're going to be involved in picking players and all that stuff? I'll be blocking for them. <laughs> <laughs> With that kind of money I'm looking after. Wait, that was just John improvising, you know. He is such a fan. He was so great that way. Living his dream as an Argo owner, the 40-year-old movie star put his career on hold and became a tireless promoter of his beloved Argonauts. The vision was every game was going to be an event. We wanted to make every game a special event. And we kicked it off with the Blues Brothers at, at halftime and post game. Come on, 
First of all, I would wax his car and do his lawn if he asked me, okay? That's how loyal and, and, and how much I love this man. He said, hey, Jimmy, you want to come up with a jet with me and Wayne and Bruce and a bunch of people for the opening of the Argonauts game? I want, when's the date? It was so exciting uh, to have everyone talking about the CFL again. You know, mainly I was there because John was my friend. That's why. Yes, he lived in L.A., but he really loved being Canadian. And I think that was his passion for, you know, being a part of this team. He wanted to bring his friends up there and show them a good time and also show him what he was, you know, proud of. It was showtime every week. It's the Sky Dome, when the, when the roof opened, baby, it was showtime. I remember the league needing a shot in the arm, and they absolutely provided that. It was the place to be. We came to see the show. All these seats used to be empty last year. You have a major movie star who would go to every little nook and cranny to sell not only the Toronto Argonauts, but the whole CFL. All of Vancouver right to be there? Yeah. We toured the country. We went to every every CFL city. And you know, he was flying around on his own nickel. At the time, the CFL had a rule that you couldn't lift the black on unless it was a sellout. Look at this. John would then do 24 hours of media, pleading to the fans, come buy a ticket. We're lifting this black out. Thank you all for showing up. It's terrific. You know, there are tickets still available. We would get out the four o'clock in the morning and we'd get in the car and we'd drive to every morning radio show. John Candy, who's been signing autographs for the last hour or so. We'd rally the community, we'd go to charity events. I believe we busted every blackout that season. He truly enjoyed going to the games and he loved being a part owner of the Toronto Argonauts, there's no question about it. Promoting the league was the dream role for John. But the real payoff? the heart of the matter was his love for the players. He wanted to hang out with the players, not just in the locker room. He'd invite the guys out, you know, he'd, he'd call you if you were injured. I think he would have been with us every second if he could have been. You know, I remember in Calgary when I had a concussion and I remember John came into the hospital and everybody was like, oh, John Candy's your John Candy's so, and that, so it made me feel even more important because I'm like, yo, your John Candy coming to see me. His heart was so big. Mike, they don't have a cappuccino machine in the locker room. You know, we, that's, next thing you know, one shows up, you know. He pulled out an old pack of matches and he wrote his name and uh, he put candy on it and he gave me his phone number and he said, anything you guys need, anytime, I'll always be there for you. You know, we can't tell him, but here I'm telling him, he did a wonderful job. He touched a lot of us. With John's passion for the game, you didn't want to let him down. Donegan looks to the end zone. Touchdown! We didn't lose one game at home that year, which included the Eastern Final, where there were 50,000 fans in the stands. Final score, 42-3. The Toronto Argonauts are heading for the Grey Cup. Going into the Grey Cup game, I remember John was like, make sure you guys put your helmet up there one more time. <laughs> You show them who's going to dictate the game, and I, I, I get goosebumps still talking about it. The most inspirational moment for me that entire year may have been John Candy standing on the sideline in a leather coat in 20 below at the Great Cup. He's not up in the press box where the, you know all the heat and all. He, 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 he is down on the field with his guys. And now all of a sudden, I'm not as cold. The 1991 edition of the Toronto Argonauts. 36 21 victors over the Calgary Stampeders today at Winnipeg Stadium. And it's appropriate. This is beaming. You know, it's like this is, this is, a, this is so happy. We had speeches. I got up there and I said, This is about one person. John, please get up here. John got up there and got emotional and he started crying. To own a team, and to see that team in one season go 
from I wonder how they'll do to winning the Grey Cup was as thrilling for John as anything could have been. We had the parade uh, downtown and it was just like, man, everybody was so happy and man, I just remember jumping on his back and hugging him, man. He wanted to do something special for the city and he was actually able to accomplish it and, and to be a part of it, it really made me feel good. The pride that he must have felt as a, as a local boy hoisting that cup, the parade here, that, that must have been huge for him. 91 was, was unbelievable. He brought back the, the passion, the glory of the, of the Toronto Argonauts and of the CFL. He looked back on it and it seems, it seems like it was um, a flash in the pan. It seems like it was just it was an explosion of energy, of good times, of passion, love, of pain, sacrifice, and it was just gone. In 1992, the fairy tale came to an end. Despite winning a Grey Cup the previous year, the high-priced Argonauts were losing money. Star quarterback Matt Dunnigan left for Winnipeg, and the Argos missed the playoffs. McNall's commitment to the team began to waver. I had a big responsibility in my mind to, to John and Wayne. Uh, John was capped in the investment he'd made at a million dollars, but Wayne was not. So we both had to pour, pour money in, and I realized, what can we do to change? I mean, we, we won the Grey Cup, we had Rocket, I didn't know what else we could do to bring revenues in. But Candy was determined to turn it around. He was always looking at angles to try and like boost, you know, ticket sales or uh, just keep, you know, morale going in the stands and on the, on the field. The Rocket left for the NFL. And during a three-win season in 1993, Candy uncovered a heartbreaking truth. Do I remember the last time I saw John? Uh, yeah, John and I had a difficult conversation, actually. Um, John was not aware that Bruce had asked me uh, to find a buyer for the team. John felt that I uh, betrayed uh, him and the trust of the club. Um, at the time, I was doing what my boss told me to do. I talked to John about this, uh, but, you know, we said, John, we're going to have to do something. And it had a lot to do with my own financial situation at the time, because I, I had major debts out there trying to find a way to cover everything. The CFL was one of the assets. It was losing money. As many assets as I had, a lot of it was a house of cards. I knew when money from our ticketing office was going to L.A., pay hockey bills. You know, there's something going on. John was emotionally invested. He didn't want to sell. He was passionate about it. It meant everything to him. He knew what had to happen. He understood the issues. Uh, emotionally, though, you know, he, he wore his heart in his sleeve. And the, tar the Argonauts were a, a part of his family. And for him just to walk away from a family member, no, it wasn't going to happen with John. I could definitely tell when they were in financial trouble, he was having a hard time with it. It's a Simon and Garfunkel uh, reunion concert, uh, December 93. You know, at that point, John was, uh, was having what he called panic attacks. It happened may maybe a couple of times that night where we would start walking off the stage and then he would have to stop and, and, I, uh, and I would just look over and go, panic attack? And he'd go, yeah. Those last few times that I did see him, he was flying in really tight schedule, you know, coming in just for lunch, you know, and it's like, uh, he had a lot on his mind. The team was sold very quickly, and uh, I think he was in Mexico shooting the film when that did happen. He got a phone call from uh, Toronto, and I, they'd been told that the team was sold. I know that that really hurt him. If there's any memory of it, is he had love for that team and, um, and every player on that team. 
I wanted to call him. It was actually the night before uh, he passed, and uh, he liked that the support. And I decided not to do it. I thought, I don't want to bother him in case he's sleeping or he's resting. I feel really bad that I never made that call. Good evening. It was news that caught everyone off guard. The laughter stopped, and there were more than a few tears. Canadian actor John Candy has died. I remember I was at work, and I thought my brother was kidding because he called me up on the phone. And he, I said, man, quit messing around. He said, no, I just heard it on the radio. You think about how many people have the opportunity to help people, but don't. And then you think about somebody who goes out of their way and doesn't have to. And so that's why it was so powerful, like, even now. That little star right there. We, you know, we put this on uh, John's, on our jersey the year, that next year, in, uh, in remembering John Candy. You know, this will uh, go uh, to my grave with me. Uh, that's just how much he meant to me. The only regret I have is that my fiasco that I created brought the whole thing into a mess where I had no choice but to sell it. He's received many awards. I think there wouldn't be a higher honor for him. He'd love it. For him to get his name finally put on it was, you know, a very big deal for us as a family. And, you know, I know that uh, he's uh, somewhere, you know, smiling because of it. I think with anything, you, know, you love, you, you don't care if you get paid or not. Because you, know, you love doing it, because you have that passion for it. If you don't, if it's a job, then rethink it. If it's, uh, I think anything you do, you have to do it from your heart.